-hmm. about many compositions that they are writing now, we will run across pedal notes. Now you can play a chromatic scale going down in half steps without using any vowels. I'll use the vowels first. <laughs> Now, with the proper lip adjustment and the breath, everything coordinating, you can do that without using any vowels. Of course, the quality will not be the same because you are more or less fighting the construction of the instrument, but the pitch will be there. We can also play three notes at one time. There is a composition that Ernest Williams wrote called Etude de Concert, where you're playing along, millions of notes uh, written, and all of a sudden you come across a chord. And the chord is an F major, starting on the first space, F, A, C. And then you stop all of a sudden and say, well, uh, there must be a mistake. This must be a piano cue. But it is not. It's a part to be played. Uh, playing three notes at one time. Now, I'll take a few measures previous to this particular part and see if you can hear the three notes. <laughs> These were the three notes, uh, individually. <coughs> now I'll do them together. <coughs> and the next chord. <coughs> Could you hear them? Could you? Yeah. Chokes you right up, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Now that uh, kind of playing is very effective out in the middle of Yankee Stadium on a windy day. But uh, how you approach that, the chord is F-A-C. You play the A, hum the C. Of course, you have to hum through the nose. You don't hum through the mouth. There's no other way of humming except through the nostrils. Because you have to blow air through the lips to be producing one note humming another one, and then the F will come out. If one note that you're playing and the other note you're humming are perfectly in tune, the A to C, those two notes must be in tune, otherwise the F will not be heard. But it's just a little uh, sideline uh, phase of, of playing, kind of a novelty uh, angle of it. Now, getting back to the slurs. Slurs lead into what we call the trill. Trilling we can do in half steps, whole steps, minor thirds, so forth. But uh, then we come into what is called the lip trill. <laughs> you don't have to move the valve. <laughs> when you get into this particular register, it's rather awkward to play trills, whole steps. Because when you get in this register, you have so many alternate fingerings of getting other notes out. In other words, when you get up to E on the fourth space, you can play it open. You can play it one and two. You can play it third valve by itself, and you can play it all three valves. But that's kind of handy in a certain respect because you can resort to what they call the lip trill, where you don't change the valves. A lip trill you can do in a whole step. You can't do a lip trill in a half a step. It can be in a whole step or a minor third, such as E, fourth space to G above it. You'll run across many 
compositions that have these trills. And if you start to develop using what they call a lip trill, to me, it is not a lip trill, it's a tongue trill. Starting with the E, this is referring to the cornet and trumpet players, and I'm sure it would apply very much the same with the other brass instruments. Using the fourth space E, hit that note with an open throat, ta, ta. In other words, try to keep the sound as open as you can. Then you start to quiver the tongue, more or less like this. As if you were saying the word key and just quiver the tongue. In other words, hit the note, then start lifting the tongue up towards the roof of the mouth as if you were in the process of saying key. In other words, keep the tongue that high and just quiver the tongue. Now, there are a couple other things you want to keep in mind also. Hit the note with an open throat, then start lifting the tongue and then making the pitch of that E go as sharp as you can make it. It's going to take a little work. I mean, it's not something that'll happen overnight. It'll maybe take two nights or three. Now, I'm going to put all three vowels down and then lift the tongue gradually towards the roof of the mouth and keep it in a quivering. In other words, it's a, it's a quiver. A quiver is something you're not really controlling. A lot of people will use a lip trill and play it very well uh, by moving the lips back and forth, but you're rather limited to how fast you can do that. Especially when your lip starts to get a little tired, then you don't have the control of it. But this motion of the tongue, I think, will be much quicker and you'll have much more control of it. And I think it's easier all around to do it. It's a lot of work in the beginning. But I'll play the fourth space E with all three valves, then start lifting the tongue. You'll hear the quality of tone change. But I'm doing this slow so that you can get the idea of what I'm referring to. And quivering the tongue. Can you hear the quality and the pitch go sharp? After I hit the E, then the quality wasn't quite as open because the tongue is going towards the roof of the mouth. But in a quivering motion. And the speed of the motion of the tongue will be the speed of the trill. You can take a composition such as the opening of the trumpet voluntary of Purcell. That has some lip trills that can be applied. You can also take the last movement of the Haydn trumpet concerto which has a section, one measure following the other, of trills coming down. Now, it's a lot easier working out lip trills than it is trying to what they call shadow box with the valves. But this is something that will take practice. I wouldn't suggest playing and practicing this a lot at one time because there is quite a lot of back pressure involved in this because you're approaching it with a very closed throat, not closed to the point where the air isn't getting through. But just practice it a little bit at a time and a little bit every day. Then you can also get into another phase of slurring where you get what is called the glissandos. And they can be either two octaves or it can be shorter phrases. Now there's an opening of a Carnival of Venice by Del Stegers, and it opens up with the cornet or the trumpet slurring cadenza. Now, Mr. Stegers has a recording of this. Uh, made with a Goldman band around 1929 or 1930, which is a collector's item today. And I had the pleasure of studying with Mr. Stegers in 1935 and 36. A great trumpet player, a great, great musician, great person. And I would say, going down and looking through the past history of cornet soloist, I would put him just about at the top. He was a sensational cornet soloist with fire 
and a style of playing that would just thrill you, give you the goosebumps when he played. Just absolutely sensational. And when somebody plays and your spine begins to tingle, you're, you're getting the message. Now, are there any questions that you would like to ask? Something I discussed might not have been clear enough. I might be able to make a little clearer. Are there any questions at all? Yes, sir. Uh, maybe you have a quarter note or a uh, stop staccato quarter note or a, an eighth note at the end of the phrase, and you don't want to punch it. You know, how would you suggest you attach it and release it so that you don't punch it? Uh, would you play anything at all? Just give me an example, then I'd be able to understand it a little clearer. It's all according to what type of a number, whether you're playing a march, which should be lively. Now, are you referring to a melodic line, you know, or something rather slow? Then you would definitely not use that approach. You would use more or less of a mezzo staccato on the last note. It also is according to the tempo. It's all according to what's been happening previous to how you are going to taper the note. Well, we'll do this one, two, three, four, and changing on the fourth count to the A concert. Is that what you're referring to? You just relax the tongue for that attack. In other words, hit it more or less with a do attack. Da, da, or do, either one. But as I mentioned before, I went through those five variants or degrees of an attack. Remember I started with a slur, then the legato? As I mentioned before, we use all these different styles of an attack in our playing all the time. But we're just not conscious of it. But we have to be flexible enough to be able to create and put all of these various styles of an attack into use to fit the type of music that we're playing. It's just not a matter in music of playing a note long or playing it short. We have all these phases and different degrees of an attack to be applied at the right time, whatever the composer had in mind, the style of the music. Now you can take a march. In general, you're not going to play too legato. There you wouldn't play legato. You would play staccato, brisk, you know. Not too rigid, not to the point of where it's unmusical. Now I'll do that same thing. Going overboard with the attack, I don't even want to refer to it as staccato or staccatissimo. It's going to be very unmusical because I'll be approaching it too rough. You see, it's very, very unmusical sounding. It's rigid. It's rather on the raucous sound. It has no musical value to it. It doesn't belong in the realm of music at all. When you release the note, do not go flat. In other words, when you release a note, this can also happen. Did you hear it drop in the pitch, intonation-wise? Because as I was tapering the note, I was using less air and also started to relax the lips, so that by relaxing the lips, the pitch went lower. When you are going to release a note, keeping it in tune, you just stop the air. Keep the lips relaxed, but don't relax the lips as you're going to release and stop the air. Because by opening, separating the lips, the pitch goes flat. When you hit a note in the core, that's when you get the best tone and the best pitch in the core of every note. I'll try to give you an idea what I mean. Now I'll do that softer and with a different type of an attack. The note must be hit in the core. As I mentioned before, you'll get the best tone and the best pitch when you hit a note in the core. If you hit it a little bit below the core, it'll be flat. If you hit a little bit above the core of the note, it'll be a little stuffy and sharp. These things are what we practice for. It's not just a matter of saying, well, I'm going to practice an hour or something like that. 
Why are you practicing? You've got to know why you're practicing. Good clean attacks, good coordination with the, the fingers and the tongue working together. If you have a passage that requires some single, double, or triple tongue, being able to play all of your scales. Always remember, music is built around the fundamentals. Music is different keys, different rhythmical patterns, and expression. You lack any one of those, you don't have music. Whether you're playing in the key of C, now we'll just say, well, we'll play that a half a step higher. Well, there's no big problem with that. If you know your scales, you'll only be in the key of C sharp, only seven sharps. Be flexible in practicing. Know your scales, your chromatics. Regardless of what key you're playing in, you've only got three valves to use. On the trumpet, that is, the cornet. So be flexible. Know the fundamentals, because then when you are increasing your ability with fundamentals, that means that your musicianship is developing, and you'll be able to explore more material with more control. Are there any questions? Yes. Mouthpieces are always open to a lot of discussion. Many people will feel that the heavier or meatier the lips are that you require a bigger mouthpiece. I actually don't know what the answer is. One shoe doesn't fit everybody. I think many times a person uses a mouthpiece that's too small because it came with the instrument. So that's what they use. But I think after a person has been practicing and is starting to mature and develop the embouchure, or the lip, whatever you want to refer to it as, that uh, if you are hearing a lot of air coming before a note, many times it will be due to a mouthpiece is too shallow, that the lips won't have room to work in. I have a feeling about testing mouthpieces. If you can play in the low register with a good meaty, mature quality down there, with good articulation, you've got a pretty good chance of having something that's gonna respond and it's gonna fit you. If you're getting this type of response, Many times, the lips don't have any room to work in. But when you get a mouthpiece, that will give you a good response. <coughs> when you're in the low register, your lips have to be relaxed. If the mouthpiece is too shallow, the lower you go, with the instrument, the more relaxed the lips have to be, the more meat actually is in the mouthpiece. When the vibrating surface of the lips start to touch the bottom of the cup, then it's gonna stop the sound. The vibration is gonna stop. Now you've gotta have a mouthpiece where it's going to have freedom to work in. Now you might say, well, the bigger the mouthpiece wouldn't it be harder to play in the upper register. No, you've got to have a low register to begin with. I'm not saying that when a person first starts the instrument, he's working on low G and low F sharp. But the thing is, we usually will start centering it around the middle of the staff. Now, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, going in changing mouthpieces in sizes, uh, should you uh, like go from a three to a four? Or? When you say a three to a four, in the Bach line, when the numbers are higher, the mouthpiece is smaller. The lower the number, the bigger the mouthpiece. What do you have there? Vincent Bach. Uh, what number is that? Ten and a half. Ten and a half C? The C means the size of the cup gets a little shallower. In other words, you can get a, a number 10, you go to a 9, 8, 7. As you're going lower, the mouthpiece becomes bigger. The cup is bigger, wider, the mouthpiece deeper, so that it takes a little more air. But the thing is, trying to find a mouthpiece that fits an individual sometimes does take a little work and time. I started on a four. And then a Bach four? No, it's a con. Con four. I and see. Then mm -hmm. my, and then this was my next one. It's ten and a half. I see. Of course, the numbers in one instrument company do not always correspond to numbers in another instrument. 
So the mouthpiece that you went from to this one, was it a smaller mouthpiece or is this one a bigger mouthpiece than what you want? It's a large one. It is a large one. Now, does it feel comfortable? Yes. Do you feel as if it responds in your low register and middle register? The way you would like it? Uh, it doesn't respond as much to the low. Then I would just try a mouthpiece a little bigger. Maybe a, an eight or a seven, something like that. Without the C, because the C means the cup is a little shallower than the regular number itself. The plain number, like a seven, is rather a big mouthpiece, wide or deep. But when you get it like a B cup, you'll get a seven B cup. It means the dimensions and width are the same except the cup is a little shallower, then the C cup is a little shallower yet, and then E, D and E, and so forth, it gets shallower. But just for an experimental sake, why don't you just try something a little bigger? In other words, a number in reference to a Bach, which you're playing, try something a little lower in number, which will be a bigger mouthpiece. Just try it and see what, what happens, see if the response is any better. Quality of tone might be a little more open, and the response will be more what you're looking for. But as I said, I cannot say what mouthpiece is going to fit anybody. I just don't know. You've got, to, you've got to work with it a little bit, see what the response is for this person. I want to thank you very much for your wonderful attentiveness. I want to thank you very much for coming out in this fog.